Okay, colleagues, uh, friends, um, gentlemen, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get started. It's early, but um, still, um, we have a tough session in front of us, only, I think, 90 minutes. Um, good morning to everyone. My name is Björn Kümmel from the Federal Ministry of Health in Germany. Um, I'm the Deputy Director um, for Global Health. Um, and it's a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome you here at this session of the policy track. Um, indeed, it's a great uh, honor for me um, to um, be part of this high ranking uh, format, um, really impressive. The, I'm, I'm just going to um, say a few words um, since my ministry is hosting the policy track and then obviously Asi will um, chair the, the session. The policy track is a new format um, at the World Health Summit initiated by my ministry. Um, the idea of the policy track is to bring current debates from, um, well, international settings such as Washington, New York, Geneva and elsewhere um, to Berlin, uh, to have them debated here from a Berlin perspective and to enable policymakers um, to be enriched with this perspective and to um, re-enter negotiations in Geneva and elsewhere with this, um, well, with the findings here. The policy track is aiming to be uh, an interactive session, as interactive as possible. In many of the other policy track sessions, we practically objected um, the um, colleagues to have PowerPoint presentations, and I think that worked quite well. Um, we, we tried to avoid uh, lengthy keynotes uh, in order to have the audience being um, as interactively participating as possible. With this session, I have to admit that we, as the Federal Ministry of Health, did not um, well interact at all because we felt that this is obviously the role of the um, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board to design the session. Um, and, and it's a great uh, pleasure to have you here. Um, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, as you all know, is the independent monitoring and ac accountability body to ensure preparedness for global health crisis. And I, I looked it up on my way here. Uh, on your website, uh, you're saying the work of the GPMB is to chart a roadmap for a safer world. So is the launch of the GPMB report this year, is that relevant for policymakers? And obviously it is, it is as relevant as it could be, um, especially at this crucial uh, part um, in global health. I would say from my perspective, and I'm covering quite a lot, at least in Geneva, um, global health seems to be at the crossroads, uh, in particular with regards to global health preparedness. Um, we, um, I believe that we will see a tremendously changing global health um, architecture with regards to preparedness and response within the next six months, maybe 12 months, but the global health architecture will look completely different compared between pre-COVID and post-COVID. And many of the um, tough decisions will be made in the next few months. Uh, nobody knows from us how it will look like, but um, so potentially we can still influence the setting of global health architecture, especially in preparedness um, within the next few weeks and months. But we will see whether we will um, departure from the next uh, year with a stronger multilateral structure or weaker one with a stronger WHO that is really truly enabled financially or um, the global society and global community doesn't uh, succeed in um, providing WHO with the political, technical and financial power that it needs whether we will find um, or set global health and, and in specifically global health preparedness on a rules-based structure, on a multilateral setting, fully inclusive, or whether we opt for other approaches which might be less inclusive. Um, so um, I think there's much to be debated. I think the report couldn't be um, more relevant uh, from worlds apart to a world um, prepared. I think that's the right question. I think this is um, relevant to all policymakers currently. And in order to give you one a little bit uh, provocative question, uh, I think um, so far we don't see a lack of great recommendations in global health and especially in um, pandemic preparedness, but we see a lack of political willingness to follow these recommendations. So uh, we are looking forward to uh, the presentation of your report, but I'm looking forward to um, hearing an answer how you will, or whether there are any recommendations 
um, trying to really make policymakers and governments follow your recommendations to make the world safer. Thank you. And with that, um, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. You are absolutely right. Uh, there is not a lack of recommendations, but a lack of political will and uh, leadership. But uh, that is an opportunity to thank you and through you to thank uh, Germany and salute the leadership of uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. The world will miss her. I think if it is about leadership, that is the kind of leadership that we were looking for. But she embedded all those uh, values you know, that uh, we are missing. So very pleased uh, here today to be with my colleagues you know, for the launch of our third report of the GPMB. You may remember two years ago, we launched the first one, The World at Risk, in New York, you know, in the uh, margin of the General Assembly, raising the alarm bell, telling the whole world and ourselves that we are not prepared for the next shock that will be coming our way. The question was not if, it was when. Unfortunately, it came much earlier than we expected because only six months later, so we had COVID and almost everything we feared happened. Well, we were congratulated by many saying that you were right, but it was not you know, a happy moment you know, to be right. We wish we were wrong you know, in our prediction, so it didn't happen. And the question we ask ourselves always, you know, when we are so smart you know, to predict things, why aren't we so smart you know, to prevent them from becoming disasters? Again and again, we will be confronted with shocks. We will be confronted with hazards, be they health, climate related. But the fact of them becoming a disaster or not will be depending pretty much on our level of preparedness. Do we have the early alerts? Do we have the early warning signs? But most importantly, do we have the early action you know, that will follow? If not, of course, we have nobody else to blame but ourselves. We also pointed very early on, and that's why I was referring to Chancellor Merkel, that what we really needed at the time was political leadership, strong political leadership that will be making decisions you know, based on facts, based on science, you know, based on being solution oriented, you know, looking beyond you know, confines of one geography and considering a pandemic of what it really is, which is global, global in nature, and there will be no other solution than a global solution to that. We all heard you know, the motto, none of us is safe until we all are, and everybody agrees, you know, how do we land and then translate that you know, into a reality is the great question that we were asking ourselves. The, third, the second report followed a year later, and then we uh, dubbed it a world in disorder just signaling, you know, the fragmentation of the world, you know, the difficulty to agree on anything, the multilateral system that we have and you know, believe in that we have put as a basis, you know, for our consensus and building global solutions, you know, were not considered, you know, to be the platform that we should all use in order to come to those global solutions that are required. So many nice words are being put to qualify that. Nationalism, domestic centric approaches. So in our view, it is nothing but egoism, lack of rational behaviors, you know, to take the right decisions, you know, at the right time, you not know, direct it, you know, to the questions in our time. Every time we make the photography of that situation that it looks like a doom and gloom, well, it is just a honest description of what is happening in reality. No complacency. <clears throat> but at the same time, we always try to identify, you know, what are ways to incentivize action, you know, to move, you know, from 
making a case to do something about the case. And this year's report, we still realize that it is a world, it are worlds apart, further exacerbated you know, by the availability of uh, therapeutics maybe soon and vaccines already. But here again, we have the haves and the have nots. And that is not sustainable, that is not acceptable. And that is on that basis now that we propose a certain number of actions, recommendations again. You may think that they're not new. Well, there is nothing wrong in repeating and hammering out again what needs to be done until it is heard and not only heard, but being acted upon. We segmented those many recommendations and summarized them into six, which we believe, you know, if they are taken into account, we will see a difference. And that's what we will be presenting to you today. And I'm joined, you know, with board members, you now some of them represented here, others you know, in the room, and many others, you know, online, as well as global leaders who are not members of the GPMB, but uh, whose responses, fights, and an everyday action are pretty much you know, in line you know, with what we do. So let me, on that note, invite you know, our first speaker, Dr. Ilona Kickbush, so member of the GPMB, also to take the floor. Ilona. Thank you very much, Asi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Director General. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, present to you some of the first uh, uh, key points that the GPMB discussed and uh, is presenting in its report, and uh, particularly along the lines that uh, our chair has just said that uh, some things just need repeating. Uh, as we were discussing the production of our report, we uh, constantly uh, tried to resist the temptation to uh, suggest yet another new innovative mechanism. Uh, but our message really, as you read the report, is uh, that uh, we are very, very critical of additional fragmentation in global health. We do see that the present global health governance model is weak. Uh, there is no question about it. And uh, it lacks coordination. And uh, too many of the suggestions to actually lead to coordination are ad hoc, or they don't continue to have support over time. So one of the things we have continuously highlighted in our reports is this cycle of panic and neglect. And uh, we are very worried that we are already close uh, to the neglect part of the cycle again, despite the fact that the pandemic is not over. So our standard message is that global problems need global solutions, uh, but we see that these global solutions are very, very hard to come by, that a cohesive framework for global public goods, both in terms of the way we approach problems and the way we finance solutions, is not yet accepted and adopted. And even mechanisms that were initially uh, conceived in that uh, spirit of global solidarity and global public goods like COVAX is actually moving back into the, in quotes, old model of, uh, of charity. And uh, this is truly a, a great concern. Three points that are important to us uh, uh, that is this first point on the global public goods that I have mentioned, that the resources also, even where they exist, and of course, a whole range of additional resources was found over the last 18 months, uh, are poorly aligned. And uh, also uh, the national and global priorities don't really find the right balance. And so we feel very strongly that it needs coherence in this system. And because of this call for coherence, we have reiterated uh, recommendations we have made before, but which we believe are ever more important. 
those of you that know our previous reports will know that uh, we have previously suggested a common framework to ensure solidarity and equity and to strengthen leadership and coordination. And so uh, this, of course, means that we again call uh, for the negotiation of an international agreement on health emergency preparedness and response under the auspices of the World Health Organization. And in many other sessions at this World Health Summit, uh, this call for a pandemic treaty in inverted commas has been very strong. We have also seen that, of course, and uh, it's been mentioned, the political will is important, but the political will to act, and then really the action is important. And we are reissuing our call for a UN summit of heads of state and government together with other stakeholders on pandemic preparedness and response to move the political agenda and commitment forward. But, uh, and this is something you will find very strongly in our report, that none of these solutions will be sufficient if we do not strengthen the World Health Organization. We feel strongly that the political commitment to the WHO and the financing of WHO needs to be ensured by its member states. And here again, we don't want to see a cycle of panic and neglect. So the assessed contributions are incredibly important. And as you read our report, you will see clearly that we call for a collective financing of assessed contributions and obviously an increase in uh, assessed contributions. But we also feel within the WHO there can be an improved governance of the uh, issues around uh, pandemic preparedness and response. And you will remember that after the Ebola pandemic, we made proposals which led to a number of issues, uh, the establishment of the uh, emergency program, the contingency fund, uh, the oversight body for the emergency program. We also feel, and you know that this has been a discussion in the executive board of WHO, that a standing committee on health emergencies should be established. And uh, we recommend this strongly to the member states and uh, the uh, members of the executive board. We believe that this would improve accountability, that it would facilitate closer collaboration between member states and also help uh, set uh, guidance, uh, political guidance for the cooperation with other stakeholders in the case of an emergency. Thank you very much. Thank you and, very much. Oh, I think you're handing over. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It says here, it is my great pleasure to ask uh, Jeremy Farrar to take the floor. <laughs> So it's our common great pleasure to hand over <laughs> to, to, to Jeremy, <laughs> fellow board member. You read your script well. <laughs> so Jeremy. This is what the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board does. It's, <laughs> it's democracy in action. So th thank you very much. And, and I'd also like, as, as uh, Erna said, to, to thank our chair. Actually, I, I now only chair, but previously co-chairs with uh, Grow Brentland, and, and uh, it's been an honour to serve on the board with you, us, and, and with, all, with all colleagues as well. And, and also pay tribute to the way it was structured at the start. Um, it has had its independence uh, enshrined. I, I, and I'm sure my colleagues would never feel we've had to uh, say the right things or the nice things, um, and that's been very important, I think, into our work and as a tribute to um, the founding and the way it was structured through the combination, I think I'm hoping right in saying, between the World Bank and the World Health Organization who have given us that space to be independent. And I think that's, I hope that's helpful. So I, it, you should never try and reduce a very complex problem to just a couple of sound bites or words. But I think in essence, the pandemic has shown up really two things, and, and that is inequality and a lack of trust. And actually over time, they've grown, they've not got less. And that is, I think, the critical element probably at the heart of 
of this review, which is the third review that we've we've produced. Um, and the pandemic has exposed that. Um, and uh, it's led to um, within countries and between countries. Um, it is not just between nations that inequality and mass mistrust lies, it's also within nations as well. And so we've, we've created during the pandemic a growing sense of inequality and mistrust. But if I could concentrate just on a few things, the, the, um, it's also exposed the, uh, our ability to identify, and I think very importantly use the word prevent, not just about preparation, it's about trying to prevent things and you can prevent things. Uh, it's the in ability to identify, assess, prevent, and then respond to these at a national, a regional, or a global level. And it's not as if we haven't had many warnings over the last uh, 20 years. But it's also an inequitable ability to then use the fruits of that knowledge, if you like, the fruits of sharing the data and the sharing of information, to then ensure that the tools that are required the public health tools, the social tools, the uh, PPE, the oxygen, <clears throat> as well as the products themselves of diagnostics, treatment and vaccines to both manufacture and distribute and ensure they're accessible to everybody in, in, uh, without just the ability uh, to pay. And as I say, it's exposed inequalities within countries as well as between countries. Uh, and where that's led to is a divided world. And I think it's a world that is divided now in a way that will make it extremely challenging to bring the world back together again to address the next inevitable pandemic and the next uh, great challenges of the 21st century, all of which by their very nature are transnational. And which although we talk nicely about we're all in this together or it's we're not safe until every day, in essence, we're not all in it together. Uh, because of that inequity that I started out with uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an opportunity, though, because optimism remains crucial. If um, There is an opportunity. The only chance, really, to bring about that change of a system is when you're faced or you've been through a crisis. It's very difficult to change relatively conservative structures and systems when everything seems to be going okay. If you look back over the last hundreds of years into history, the time to change is when you've had a shock and you appreciate and learn the lessons and then you say never again. Now we've said never again on a number of occasions in the last 20 years, but if we don't use this chance to make a change, then when will we? And it's not as if this is other people in somewhere else. The people coming, including to the World Health Summit, are a very privileged group of people. It's not somebody else, it's us. And I think we have to take on responsibility through the channels that we have open to us to make and bring about those change. So just very quickly, four or five key points, I think. The heart of it is <coughs> resilient health systems. That is the bedrock of everything. And crucially, at least in my opinion, yes, have the ability to pivot <coughs> when the pandemic occurs, but crucially have those strong health systems that are bringing utility and benefit to the populations all of the time and then have the surge capacity and capacity to change when a pandemic hits. I would not advise anybody to set up totally unique structures only looking at epidemics because over time they will drift away. Build it in to your existing structures and bring utility all the time. Second about data, there's a lot of talk about data and the critical need to share data are absolutely unarguable. But unless we learn to share the benefits of sharing that data, then why is the incentives to share data? So we have to link data sharing and benefit sharing. And if we don't combine those two together, I don't think we'll get the benefits of either. The GPMB strongly believes that this needs to be integrated into international agreements, as Alona just said. Uh, warm words, even political will, in my view, are not enough. It has to be matched with measurable, monitorable uh, outcomes and in outputs that you can actually hold people to account for. We have, I'm afraid, heard too many warm words and warm political will. It's about political action rather than just political will. And those need to be binding in treaties, as Erna said. As I say, inequality has grown in this time. Just a comment now from my own background in research, we've got to ensure that the research that's done is better distributed globally. The manufacturing has to be available and kept uh, again with utility all the time in a far better distributed model. And although the focus is on vaccines, quite rightly so, we mustn't ex exclude the other things that we need as well. S things like PPE to protect healthcare workers, 
It's unacceptable there is not oxygen available to save lives, as well as diagnostics and treatment. We shouldn't focus solely on any one element of that. Public health is about bringing all of those things together. And who knows, the next pandemic may not be amenable to a vaccine. So we must make sure we don't just focus all our resources uh, within the vaccine uh, structure. So there have been many reviews. GPMD has done three. There's been lots of other reviews. Leona was involved in one after the Ebola crisis. In essence, they've said many similar things. The time is now not for more reviews. The time is to take the reviews that have been done over the years, including the latest from the GPMB, and act on them. And if not now, when? And I think it's now my privilege to hand over to Ask or to Victor, or both. It is my pleasure to join you in ending. <laughs> Victor, please. Uh, you Thank see, you. we have loved working together. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, thank you, I see. Our, our chair and director general, thank you for being here. And of course, Juan Pablo from the World Bank, thank you. Yeah, it's a privilege to be part of this uh, board of GPMB. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, as uh, Jeremy said, we've been certainly very independent. Think about how we can do our job as a monitoring board. Um, I would say that uh, I agree totally with my colleagues on all the points. The question is, uh, how will we be better prepared in the future? It's fair to say that the world is far from being equipped to end the current pandemic in near term or to prevent the next one. And over the years, I believe that the world has severely under-resourced and under-invested in preparedness and uh, in global public good. COVID made it very clear that uh, resources needed to prevent, prepare, and respond to global pandemic are really woefully lacking. But if you look at the human cost and economic impact of uh, COVID-19, it far exceeds the, the money that's needed for preparedness. Um, so I think this report, GPMB, calls for sustained, proactive, investment in global public goods. So as um, been said by colleagues, you know, we need to do all those things, but we need resources. And so to be better prepared to prevent and to respond much faster, more equitably and more effectively to future outbreaks. So the resources are first to strengthen WHO. We've all said that WHO need far more resources, but also for health system strengthening, for surveillance, for countermeasures, for global public good. So as we think about this, the question is, uh, what do we need? Well, certainly health emergency preparedness response needs financing that's equitable. You heard my colleague how inequitable the world is right now. It has to be adequate, sufficient, predictable, flexible, um, scalable, and sustainable. I think those are the principles I wish to talk about resources, not just the dollar here or there, but looking at a long-term plan. Now, if you look at these resources of financing to date, it's mainly built on a donor assistant model. That is, it's dependent from a small number of countries of donors and certainly subject to the vagaries of political commitment. So financing often insufficient, unfair, and uh, poorly coordinated. So what we are saying in our report has been said by many others, but very clearly is we need a substantial increase in international funding, particularly in a bilateral fashion to support low and middle income countries, uh, to build greater preparedness, to fund global common goods and support early surge capacity. The GPMB supports the establishment of a new global funding mechanism so they can mobilize investment needed for prevention and preparedness. And this mechanism will be based on burden sharing. That is to say, rather than just a simple charity donor model that we talk about having contributors to contribute by the ability to pay. And there are many already examples of such a formula of looking at the not only countries, but also other sectors to participate in this financing mechanism. So 
burden sharing, but certainly will be supplemented by uh, development assistance and contribution from many other sectors, including private. I think importantly, the question is, how do you create such a mechanism? We do not want to create a new entity. So the idea of creating a financial intermediary fund to be held at the World Bank, but not controlled or determined how to spend it, but rather looking at more equitable way of looking at how to support global public good. So there's been a lot of estimates about how much is needed. In the G20 uh, high-level independent panel, which Jeremy and I both as service advisors, we're thinking about a total of $75 billion for the first five years. Actually, in GPMB, the number is about 10 billion per year on a sustainable basis. I think what we're saying is we need substantial scale up of funding uh, for global public good and for preparedness. Um, so it's really important to emphasize that funding should be additional and not competitive or displacement of existing dollars. So we want to say it's not displacing uh, domestic financing is not displacing or replacing exist existing funding streams or recipient organizations. So the bottom line is we need to have a mechanism, a model, a financing model, an allocation and implementation model that is inclusive, objective, transparent with oversight and accountability. So as been said by my colleagues, we all have to act. It's all our responsibility. And getting resources to the people who are on the ground doing the work is absolutely essential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Victor. Thank Jeremy. And thanks, Ilona. We have uh, heard recommendations that uh, really pushing in the directions you know, from words to action. And we see also those recommendations have been most of the time made at high, very high level rightly so, calling on leaders you know, to act, calling on international organizations also to be supported in order to deliver on their mandates. But throughout, throughout our analysis and our work, we have one constant preoccupation, which is the involvement of communities and civil societies. We are mindful of the fact that pandemic starts with communities, they will end in communities. Unless communities are involved before, during, and after, we will not have the sustained response that we would like you know, to see. Unfortunately, trust has been eroded because uh, leaders have not always held the promises they have made, many promises made, so many broken. And in that way, we cannot get the trust you know, from the communities. And it is again an opportunity to remind ourselves, you know, whatever we've been saying, doing, analyzing and recommending, our eye was put there where we are needed most, in the last village, in the last household, where the last person you know, with the virus you know, will be cured. We also rightly said that it's not only about you know, the sophisticated commodities that we're talking about like vaccines today, but also PPEs, as simple as that, oxygen. Some of us who were affected or infected by COVID know how important oxygen is. Oh my God, it tastes so good. Now, if uh, you get the virus and then you get you know, this liter of oxygen, then you will sell anything you know, to get that. And then you realize you know, how important it is. And it boils down you know, to that level. And again, our action and the recommendations that we are talking about will be measured, you know, right at that level. Ultimately, a world prepared will depend on our collective actions. So no amount of resources will replace trust. But we know that it is so important to build, uh, so difficult to build trust in the middle of a crisis. And that's also what preparedness is about. Let's build the trust before, let's nurture it during, and let's cultivate it after you know, so that we can withstand the next shocks and hazards. We know what to do now, and we must do it. And thank you for hammering the fact that we must do it together. So thank my first panelists, and I'll be inviting the next round very soon.
Am I right? The participation and responsibility of countries in pandemics is extremely important. It's not enough to have the global community committing, but the specific countries need to commit to support not only their citizens, but the citizens of the world. In particular, those countries that are much developed, because given that this is a very global event, we are one uh, when, when we are talking about pandemic and that nobody will be safe until we are all safe, as uh, the Director General of WHO has said. And that means then that every one of us, from the individual to the countries to the global community, uh, need to take responsibility for the specific peace that we are responsible for and that we can contribute to. What are the likely possibilities of our next pandemic? There are the standard ones, and those were well outlined by previous GPMB reports and by organizations such as CEPI and WHO. Now, those kinds of quote-unquote classical zoonotic spills have now an additional possibility coming in because of the vagaries of climate change, altering biodiversity and environmental impacts of various kinds, which make zoonosis more likely in more unusual contexts. Now, the, to answer what do we do, the only way where we can be prepared to deal with these kinds of situations, which border on the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns is a very simple one, but very difficult to do, which is extraordinary capacity building in every part of the world. We should move away from parachuting solutions into crisis zones, which it has some effect at the time of a crisis, to building capacity of a very strong way so that local reaction can be tied to what the local problem is in, in very strong ways, which are right now perhaps not easy to imagine. The 2021 GMPB report shows how we can come together as a global collective. It calls for more political leadership, more sustainable and stable resources, and more accountability. It calls to strengthen the WHO and health emergency ecosystem. And it urges us to find agreement on sharing fruits of R&D to deliver equity so that all countries have access to treatments, vaccines, and countermeasures for pandemic preparedness and responses. Without concerted collective action, our world remains unprotected and unprepared. The words of uh, members of the GPMB that could not be in Berlin and uh, were contributing, you know, from uh, you know, their respective uh, homes. So we know also that the GPMB was not uh, created, you know, ex nihilo, but were co-convened by uh, WHO and the World Bank. And I would like to uh, salute and thank, commend the leadership of uh, WHO and the World Bank to co-convene an independent you know, monitoring body, but at the same time engaging with them, but giving full independence. And never ever in these uh, last years of our work, not one single time interfere with our analysis, with our recommendation. I think that is the sign of leadership. That is a sign of respect. That is a sign of trust. And we would like really to thank you uh, very, very warmly. Thank you very much.
And on that note, I would like to invite the Director General of WHO, my friend and brother, Dr. Pedros, not to address us. Thank you. I was listening very carefully to the first panel, to the chair and uh, uh, Ilona, uh, Jeremy and Victor. Um, I think there are two requests here to the world. Please listen and act because the recommendations have been there for a long time and even whatever is added is almost something similar. So I think that's how I can summarize what you're saying. And I could even read some frustrations because you've been saying we have said it many times. So this time, I think it can be summarized as listen and act, which I fully agree. Um, GPMB Chair uh, El Hajj Asi, my brother, and Victor Zhao, Jeremy Farrar, members of the um, GPMB and others who joined earlier uh, virtually, mm, Ilona, uh, and our host, uh, Bion Kumel. And also, I would like to welcome the two next uh, panelists and my uh, our um, co convener, also the bank, uh, uh, Juan Paulo, uh, and also to Ayo, Ayoade, uh, excellencies, uh, uh, colleagues, and friends. The new report from the GPMB is a brave report, the kind that could only be produced by real veterans in the field. It takes courage and experience to say we do not need new recommendations because the previous recommendations out there were good ones, and they still have not been fulfilled. This is not a new problem, as they have already said it. And we've actually been in the, on the same page on many occasions. In fact, one of the first major speeches I gave after assuming the role of Director General at Columbia University in 2017, that was the first major speech, was when I reminded the audience of the often forgotten 1918 influenza pandemic and warned that the world was not prepared for another one. Following from this, in 2018, WHO and the World Bank came together to form the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. Of course, we did not know when the next global crisis would arise or what it would be but we knew it would come eventually and that the world was not ready and urgent action was needed. The first GPMB report, as you remember, was released in September 2019, months before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, presciently identified many of the challenges that we faced during the last two years this included the areas of political leadership and commitment, health systems, readiness, uh, trust with communities, and international cooperation. The second GPMB report released in the midst of the pandemic in 2020 incorporated hard-won insights with calls for predictable and sustained financing, equitable access for vaccines, and other life-saving tools and global governance for preparedness. Now, at this third report is released, uh, in some countries, there appears to be a view that the pandemic is over. It's not. If we do not continue to suppress transmission and equitably distribute vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, the pandemic will be drawn out even further bringing needless suffering and death. This is a critical juncture. As the world's attention turns to other issues, 
and during one of the first GMP meetings, I mentioned the old saying, the time to fix the roof is before the rain comes. For the same reason, you establish a fire department or an emergency room. We cannot wait until the next emergency before we act. We cannot keep putting out fires with bucket brigades. The GPMB asks if we have learned the lessons of this pandemic. If the world is even less prepared now than it was before COVID-19. We must also take a hard look at our weakened public health systems, the fragmentation of our global health architecture and the crisis of trust in our scientific institutions. This is important, not only for this pandemic, but for the threats of the future. And as this new report makes it clear, it's crucial not only that we act, but that we act in a coherent, coordinated manner. There is no room for a narrow self-interest and short-term political considerations when it comes to emergency preparedness. The report lays out concrete actions, and here are a few. An international agreement on preparedness and response, a strengthened WHO with sustainable funding through an increase in assess contributions, better information sharing, a collective financing mechanism, community engagement, and mutual accountability. By the way, this follows the excellent recommendations from IPPR. I think what matters now is the implementation. My friends, future generations will judge us not by the crisis we faced, but on how we reacted to them and the actions we took to prevent and prepare for the challenge of the future. So as I started with two words, I will leave you with two requests. Let's listen and let's act. It's within our power to do things differently this time by coming together to take the smart, coherent, and long-term actions that will keep us all safer. I thank you again for this opportunity and thank you for your hard work and look forward to working with you uh, closely. Uh, and really thank you so much for your dedication to you, Asi, and also to Gro, who just uh, uh, left us because she wants another <laughs> challenge maybe to take. Uh, and also thank you to all member, member, uh, uh, members of the GPMB. And of course, uh, Ian uh, Smith, uh, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, you know, Dr. Tedros. I think we also have to acknowledge that uh, these difficult times have also been also times of uh, solidarity, times of uh, coming together, working together, uh, building this community of carers, you know, that I represented largely in this room. And we were members of the GPMB, but we were not alone in that response and in the fight. There are many out there who are doing similar work or even the pioneering work that we could have you know, built on. Some of them are represented you know, here in this room and I would like to recognize them and through them recognize you know, all of those who express solidarity, kindness, support and care you know, in our common struggle. So I saw Dame Barbara Stocking you know, was with us, you know, another figure and leader. You know, my friend Michelle Kazashkin you know, is in the room. Our common friend Anders Nordstrom is here. And my sister and friend, Professor Marikol Sek, our gender champion and health, Papa Dat is here, just to name a few, and many others in this room and following us, you know, online, showing again that we are not alone. And if we built on this, you know, collective force for change then we will definitely you know, get to where we would like to be by responding to the call made by Jeremy. No more warm words you know, of uh, will and leadership, but action and action on the ground. 
On that note, I would like now to invite the next panelist on the stage. And it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome a co convener colleague and friend, Dr. Juan Pablo Uribe, who's right here with us here from the World Bank. Now, welcome uh, my friend and sister, Yodi Alakija. Welcome, Yodi. And online, we've joined by also friends and colleagues, uh, Michelle Sidibe who's joining us uh, from Cote d'Ivoire online, and Jane Holton uh, in uh, Australia. It's good to see you again, Jane, and welcome. So um, I hope Michelle is also online that we could, uh, we could see. So I'm delighted that you were able to join us here today. I think, again, champions you know, you're in your own rights, leaders in your own rights, and again, expressing solidarity and uh, uh, common cause for our common cause today. So, um, Yodi, we spoke a few weeks ago about vaccine access in the global south. We're all aware of the enormous disparities in the vaccination rollout. Is this just an issue of resources? Who has the funds and I will pay? Or is it a symptom of a much more endemic problem of inequity? Can you give us you know, your insight you know, based on your experience you know, working on the topic and in the African region? Um, thank you very much. It's really a delight to be here today to see you all. And um, a relief, I want to thank um, the Director General before I make my, my remarks for all the incredible work that he's been doing over the last two years. Um, and also so many of you here in this room, we can see and feel the exhaustion. And that brings me to the answer. It isn't just about resources. It is about deep inequity. It is about a system that is broken. It is about a neglected system. It's about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I thought about it very carefully, you know, thank you so much for the invitation. It, it, it's an absolute honor to be here. But I also seriously considered not coming, not because the journey was going to be too long, but because as we've heard from the previous panelists, we're all saying the same things. Nobody is doing anything. The system is fractured at its very core and you know, Jeremy, so Jeremy said that it is a time of crisis that you, re, you reshape, you reform. And if we don't take that opportunity now, we have wasted the opportunity. But not only that, we have created so much, so much, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We've created a problem going forward. So there is deep inequity in the system. It's not that we don't have vaccines that we can share. It's not that we don't have therapeutics. It's not that we don't have the tools as we, we hear from the ACT Accelerator, is that we choose not to act. The previous panel talked and your recommendations are fantastic, but what are we doing about it? When are we actually going to change the system? When is this 20th century man-made, largely male-led system going to change? When are we going to break this whole thing apart and rebuild again, rebuild from new, because you cannot, you can't, we're trying to patch up a system that's broken. We're trying to put glue and band-aids on something that is a, it, it's a multiple compound fracture. Inequity, deep inequity within the global system is what has brought us to where we are. Who is going to build the memorial to the millions of lives that are lost on the African continent that right now nobody is counting and nobody is measuring? It is inequity in the system that means that we don't have many people here from the global south because quite frankly, they can't get here because they don't have the vaccine passports. They don't have the ability to test. They don't have the ability to, to navigate the system. So we are creating a totally divided world within an already divided world. Inequity is at the is the root cause of all of this, you know, and maybe with a little bit of 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 of, of you know to, to bring it down a little. I would maybe say that if it's happy to see Rupa here, that maybe if women, uh, you know, ruled the world, if we led the world, let women lead, perhaps we would be able to show some more compassion in this moment. We'd be able to show that we have a world that 
needs fixing because it is not just this current pandemic. I say like COVID, like climate. You know, the climate change conversations are going on right now. And I don't know about, about, about many of you, but I'm tired of the same conversation. So we heard from the previous panel, and I wrote in my notes, it is not, it is not what to do, it is how. It is not just how to do it, but it is when. And it is also who has the courage. Who has the courage to say that, no, it is not just mutual accountability. What does mutual accountability even mean in a system where this world is so inequitable that people are being left to die whilst others are, giving, are being given boosters upon boosters if we talk about vaccines or are being provided monoclonal antibodies when my brother here has to talk about the sweetness of oxygen because that is gold to us in places like Africa. This world is broken. It's not about money. The money is there. It's wonderful to have here, you know, um, Juan Pablo from the bank, you know, wonderful to have people who have resources, philanthropists and, 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 and foundations and organizations that, that, that can say, bring the money to the table. But how, who's going to hold them accountable? Who's going to hold the world accountable for hoarding vaccines? Who's going to hold the world accountable for failing to deliver? We need to fix the inequities in the system. And this is the moment to do it. And that's why I came to Berlin. So thank you for this, this opportunity. I've come to say, who has the courage to stand up and say enough is enough? Who has the courage to say that Africa will not be left behind, that Latin America will not be left behind, that the Pacific Islands will not be left behind, that you in the global north cannot sit there and tell us what to do with our lives and how to live it, or whether we can live or whether we're going to die, because you have the power and you have the money. No, power has to change hands, and power has to change hands in this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much you know, for the passion, the words, and I think the truth you know, in every word you know, that you said you know, today. And uh, indeed, you know, it is broken, but uh, it is our collective responsibility to fix it. And I think it joins you know, the title of this report you know, that we are launching today. How can we move from worlds apart you know, to a world you know, that is you know, prepared? Juan Pablo, over and over we said that the investment in preparedness is minuscule. It is not uh, enough compared to the trillions of dollars or euros we are losing you know, from the pandemic. How do we get leaders to invest in prevention and preparedness? And from your experience, both you know, as a member of government you know, in your past and in your current you know, position as our co-convener in the bank, Please share your wisdom with us. Thanks, um, Asi, and, and thanks to everybody, Ted, Rosario, the panelists. Um, very difficult to talk after you, by the way. Uh, but I'm going to try to to provide some, um, let's say, organized thoughts around the question on, on how to try to get more investments in pandemic preparedness. Uh, and of course, the answer is not simple. If it was, uh, we wouldn't have failed for so many years in achieving this um, globally in an um, equitable way. Um, and, and I do believe, again, that uh, on, on the back part of the story is, uh, is this panic and neglect is something more deeper that Ayo was uh, referring to in her thoughtful comments. And it's um, a lot of competing needs in a highly unequal field uh, where not only fatigue comes, but also uh, priorities are replaced by the hardship of day-to-day -day life. Uh, and that's what happens in, in our countries. Um, so, so the ideas I want to organize quickly, uh, just so that we all have them present, and again, they don't come in a simple equation. Um, they're all included in the report from GPMB, and, and, and I want to pause here just to praise both the independence and the commitment of, of, of the board, AC. Uh, extremely important features to defend and maintain in the future. But these ideas are, of course, the first one, including your question, is, is the economic rationale behind 
the investment in pandemic preparedness. But we've known that for a long while. We still need to go back to it. We still need to remember that it's a good investment, a good social investment, but it's not enough. It seems to fade away. Um, I would say, second, that also being concrete and pragmatic in what it implies to invest in pandemic preparedness helps. It's not something vague. It's not something um, that cannot be identified in concrete actions and investments in very specific functions and capabilities in a community health center or in a public hospital or overall in a health system. So just listing and talking about concrete actions will also help in guiding investments. Jeremy said something that uh, I consider is fundamental and the World Bank um, pursues it a lot. And it's that in, 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 in the bottom of all of this, we need strong health systems. We, we cannot have a strong pandemic preparedness isolated from the reality of, her, of our health systems. Um, so arguing pandemic preparedness interventions linked intentionally to more structural and sustainable efforts in health system strengthening should also help in the response. Um, Victor talked a lot about the need, and Tedros has always insisted on it, of having additional resources and having, of course, support for many countries who will not be able, even by leveraging their best effort to address the needs that their health systems have in order to have proper pandemic preparedness and response. Um, and again, here I want to just quote the end result of this study, recent data from, from the bank, uh, from double chuck to double recovery. And it's if, if we don't do anything, more than 50 countries in the next five years will not be able to even come back to the health spending levels that they had prior to the pandemic. And we're expecting them to be able to further address needs that have been there structurally for many, many decades. That's impossible. We, we cannot be realistic if we don't, again, look for the instruments and the financing additional uh, resources for that uh, preparedness to happen. I would end with three other, let's say, guiding criteria who are, I believe, um, essential for ownership and for accountability. And there are one, the capacity of independent monitoring. Again, we're talking about a specific functions. We're talking, talking about specific activities and we need independent monitoring with transparent data that becomes visible and uh, increases accountability and responsibility here. The second element has to do with community engagement, with social leaders having a clear voice in following through with this global and local need. And finally, the opportunity and the importance of regional approaches. Um, I would say for countries, when they come together in the region, when they can emulate their neighbors in a way when they can have, let's say, um, a fair competition in terms of strengthening and also coming together across borders, as we've seen in Africa, by the way, um, will also support and enhance our capacity to advance. Um, AC, I, I, I would just want to conclude again, because nothing of this is new for all of you, by saying that this all um, requires collective leadership. And, and that means that we all need to do our best effort every day in our responsibilities and in our part of reaching this global response. And in, do, in doing so, we also need to acknowledge that this has to be a continuous process that we're not gonna be able to move from A to B in a sudden chuck, that we need to be consistent and we need to be persistent in being better prepared for the future needs of our societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, no, Juan Pablo. Thank you for inviting us to be concrete and pragmatic, you know, again. So Jane, thank you so much for joining us online, you know, again. Last time uh, we spoke, Jane, you said something that really stuck with me. You said, uh, I quote, while history is important, the world has changed profoundly. 
And you said further, we can't keep fighting the last war. What did you mean by that? And what do we need to do about it in this uh, particular context and in our discussion today? Thank you. And um, my best regards to so many friends who are there in Berlin. I only wish that I was where, there with you. So this conversation could continue. But in the short few minutes that I have, and you're right, I have said exactly that. And what concerns me, and I think we've just heard some powerful advocacy around fundamentally the same thing, which is if we keep doing the same thing over and over, why would we expect a different result? And so uh, what we tend to do is frame our recommendations or our advocacy around the same kind of challenges. And then we're surprised that nothing happens. And I think the challenge for us is to focus on how we're going to make this change. Like so many people who are there, I was in that room in New York two years ago when this, the first report was released. Actually, we're all standing rather close together, which in the current context would feel a little uncomfortable. And we all, uh, I think, talked in a vaguely theoretical sense about pandemic, never expecting that we were about to be in the world as quickly as whilst we have foretold we ended up being. And so what I think I'd like to reflect on is how we change the discussion about the how. And the panel has done a fantastic job about what needs to be done. But what we can't seem to do is to motivate people to do something about it. Now, the bank has an important role here, not just in independent monitoring, but also, in my view, in actually changing the discussion. When we started COVAX, funnily enough, the whole world was in it together because nobody knew whether we would actually get any vaccines that worked. And all of a sudden, the uh, ability to participate collectively in the acquisition of potentially one or only one of a small number of vaccines bound people together. So we need to ask ourselves, in my view, what is it that genuinely binds people together? And the bank, I think, has a really important role here because it is the case uh, that at the moment, we do forget so quickly the cost, the personal cost, the community cost, the financial cost, the cost to lives, the cost to generations, as we've just heard. And I think thinking about how uh, we actually articulate that and that need in language that is sustainable in the places where this is going to actually help us get these actions implemented is so important. So we don't just fight the last war. So we don't just replicate the behavior from last time. The panel's talked about identification, prevention and response. How true is that? Absolutely. But what we don't know is how we actually get decision makers, not just us, us health people who talk to each other and uh, all nod earnestly and agree that we need to do more about this. How do we motivate others, just as we did at the beginning of COVAX, to come together? And what we don't want is to revert to that donor model, which sadly is what we're doing with vaccines at the moment. Uh, what we should be doing is ensuring those global public goods and then the capacity to produce those and distribute them equitably. But of course, what we tend to do is say, how do we get more donors? Um, how could we produce more so it would be more equitably dis distributed? Instead of saying at the outset, how do we solve this problem for the world at the beginning, not give the global south the crumbs, the leftovers, the things that are not used once others have finished. Although I note that uh, the rapid run into booster doses may delay even those crumbs, and that would be a complete tragedy. Can I say one other thing? Uh, the panel, I think being a little generous, says the health emergency ecosystem is broken. What I would say to you is there is no such thing as the health emergency ecosystem. We have never really properly designed this health ecosystem, this health emergency response capability. 
You know, global countries come together uh, to actually design how aeroplanes will fly around the world because they don't want to run into each other. Well, why is it we cannot design something which is the equivalent so we do not collectively share the burden, the cost, human and financial for the next pandemic? So we also need, in my view, to communicate a message. This is not a once in a hundred year event. This is not something that you can forget. You can write a scholarly book about and then we'll never touch a generation again. We know that is not the case. So to my mind, this report, fantastic report, but let's talk about how it's not just us in an echo chamber actually doing what we have done previously, fighting the last war, talking about more donors, uh, just more manufacturing. Let's change this up. Let's do it a different way. And let's do that by making this everybody's business and not just ours. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, let's do us. Let's do that by making it everybody's business and not only ours. I think it's a very good, you know, summary. It's now my great pleasure to uh, really welcome my dear brother and friend Michel Sidibe, uh, who's joining us from uh, Cote d'Ivoire today. Michel, you've been advocating for the local and regional production of treatments, vaccines, and medical countermeasures for quite some time, long before COVID. In fact, and I remember, but how can uh, regional mechanisms deliver the equity in uh, access that global systems have so clearly failed to provide? So your past experience, as well as your current one, you know, as the special envoy for the African Union for the uh, African Medical Agency will be very valuable. Michelle, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, my brother Asi, and uh, I am very happy to be part of this panel. I think uh, the launch of this report is happening at a critical time for Africa and the world. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has exposed our continent's vulnerabilities. We have been hearing so many in assuring access to vital drugs, vaccines, and health technology. But one of the major challenges we are faced with is the inequity, you talk about it, is a lack of uh, diversification in terms of uh, uh, production lines. It is uh, about of uh, absence of uh, a political choice. I'm not talking about political commitment. So I want to say uh, that uh, uh, if you look at the continent, uh, which is uh, representing 25% uh, of the health burden in the world. I said 25%. With 1.3 billion people, we are producing only 3% of the medicine we are consuming. We are producing less than 1% of the vaccine. And when we are faced with a crisis like uh, uh, COVID, one of the biggest challenge is how to really ensure that the poorest segment of a society will get uh, uh, services uh, which they need. We realized that COVID was uh, not just a health crisis, it was an inequity crisis, but it was a human, uh, I can say, uh, uh, human security uh, crisis because um, uh, a lot of people were left behind. Out of 8 billion of vaccine who have been produced, uh, Africa received, uh, I think, a little more than uh, 200, uh, uh, a million doses. And uh, today we have more than 1.2 billion people who didn't receive one single dose of vaccine. So I want to say that uh, your question is a very pertinent one and uh, we need uh, to really uh, take that uh, uh, seriously, how to build resilience. And uh, currently this situation with a COVID-19 uh, vaccine takes us back to one we faced almost 20 years ago in the HIV AIDS crisis regarding serious discussion about uh, public goods, uh, patents, and waivers which could uh, really save lives. As African, we must be forward thinking to change the existing paradigm. To put it simply, it means four 
transformative actions. One, we need hubs of excellency for the production of vaccine and medicine. Two, I think we need to Africanize research and development while bearing in mind innovation, which is so critical. Three, we need to mutualize better competencies and think in terms of economies of scale. Fourth, we need to enhance and promote African pharmacopoeia. All this requires an ecosystem with the following eight policy elements. First, the political commitment from the highest level of government to make appropriate choices is key. Two, the right regulations and policy coherence across government agencies. Three, design fiscal and monetary responses that allow government to push on the repercussion of a crisis. Four, foster a culture of research and development and innovation in the continent. I heard you talking about incentives, ways, invest, investment in research and evaluating various funding mechanisms. Budgetary support from government is key. We cannot be just thinking about uh, fund coming from abroad, venture capital, corporate social responsibility funding beside the fiscal incentives, and six, collaboration between industry and African academia will help us to certainly go faster, including building a talent base that may be required for the industry to move up the value chain. Lastly, I think forward thinking in emerging areas like biosimilar and protection of the market access to ensure there is a sufficient demand for locally produced medicine, vaccine, and other health products. I, hence I see the prerequisite of the African Medicine Agency. As a regional mechanism, I heard you talking about that, to deliver the equity in access, such a regional collaboration of interest will certainly facilitate greater access to safe, effective, and I can say good quality medical products in the continent. It will help us also to create space for local production. As countries in Africa become more integrated into global economy, I will say that uh, with uh, this increase in movement of goods and services, African Medicine Agency, by supporting the harmonization of regulation and helping in the context of a free trade agreement, would assist joint country effort for the control of a growing cross-border market dynamic. I personally uh, think that it is uh, key for us to work together to build a more strategic solidarity. And uh, this is uh, the only way to help us to be more self-reliant uh, uh, 
and being capable to face other challenges. And it is my uh, utmost uh, pleasure to be a part of this discussion on the challenges uh, that uh, lie ahead for Africa in its uh, quest to emerge uh, its uh, health sector to global uh, excellence. I uh, want to thank you for giving me this opportunity from uh, Abidjan. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, from Abidjan. In the last uh, 10 minutes we have, I'd like to do two things, please. One is you maybe benefit from the wisdom in this room and then get maybe one or two contributions and comments from the audience and then ask each you know, of our panelists, you know, one takeaway, you know, very quickly. So um, can I uh, give the floor to Michelle Kazashkin? Mike is coming, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, truly welcome uh, the report and congratulate the GPMB for this uh, excellent piece. Um, and I think I can do so uh, on behalf of our co-chairs and all my colleagues on the IPPPR. <laughs> so difficult to <laughs> articulate. Um, now, my question or the question I'd like to put to you is, you know, with the emphasis you've put on, on the need for action and on the concrete actions that are presented in your report. We need the change to be catalyzed. Everyone has been talking about the how, but we're missing a sort of uh, igniting moment, a catalyst moment to, to start the change. Now, coming from the HIV uh, world, of course, I'm thinking of the uh, special session of the United Nations General Assembly 20 years ago. That was really the, the founding event for all the changes that happened then um, and established not only a high level political dialogue, but also an accountability mechanism whereby every five years at the highest level, the world comes together and looks at where it stands in the fight. So I see no competition here between the high level summit of heads of state that you are proposing and what's in the agenda uh, for the next weeks, be it the G20 or, or the World Health Assembly. So my question is, do you think that could be the sort of igniting uh, signal? Um, and do you think we're doing enough, uh, all of us, for it to happen? Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, let me give the floor to Barbara Stocking. Uh, yes, I'm currently chairing a panel to advocate um, for a global convention, a global pandemic convention, so it won't surprise you that I feel rather passionate about it, and therefore I'm very delighted to find that that's, you know, really now written into your, you know, into your report. But the issue that I'd like to raise out of all of this is really um, not just how we get a, a, a legally binding instrument, but how we get anyone to comply with it. Because when I talk to my colleagues, particularly in civil society, they say, well, look, we had the IHR, there were regulations in it, people were meant to comply, and they haven't. So why would we want yet another legal instrument? And I think that's a very fair question, actually. So what I really wanted to put back to you to see um, where, really where the, um, the GPMB had got to in thinking about how you act, put in action the words that you use, Jeremy used them, uh, monitoring and accountability. How is that going to be done? But perhaps that's the, there's the mechanisms for it, but really there's the underlying drive. What the real question is, how do we get governments to comply? What is the incentive for them beyond, um, obviously there's a moral position about that, and there's also, we're all in it together, that is a good argument, but that that in the in the midst of a crisis sort of doesn't hold. So what, what have you thought about in terms of how you can get, um, you know, not, as I say, not just mechanisms, but incentives into the system that make both rich Rich and poorer countries actually all want to be part of this. So that's my question, really. Thank you very much. These are 
excellent questions. I, I fear we will not be, not, be, may not be able to answer them here, but I think we will factor them definitely, I think, in our reflections and then moving forward. Because I promise uh, this room that we will leave it on time for the next session. We may not be diving too much into that. But I don't want to miss the opportunity you know, of having this wonderful panelist here and asking them, each of them, one takeaway you know, in the in three minutes, meaning, you know, uh, 50 seconds for each of them. Jane, may I, may I start with you? Can you give us one takeaway moving forward? Well, one takeaway is let's do things differently. And that actually includes the monitoring piece that Barbara um, asked you about. I think we have to think about different approaches, different data sources, um, and I think we have to use the kind of technology and systems that are available in the modern world that weren't available even in the last pandemic. So what I, what I would say is let's use the modern capacity to gather data, let's monitor, but also let's hold people to account and let's uh, identify, prevent, respond, but also let's monitor and be transparent about it. Thank you very much, Jane. Michelle, one takeaway. You're muted. <laughs> I, I, I want just to say that it's so important that uh, collectively we invest uh, better in our regulatory system to strengthen uh, uh, um, to make AMA an effective, strong uh, regulatory system for the continent. Because without a proper regulatory system, you will never have a well-functioning health system in the uh, continent. Uh, today, uh, it's time to take, uh, uh, from what I heard, a, a new space for new solidarity, creating new space uh, for reinventing even the role of working together to make sure that uh, the continent uh, will have is a strong positioning in the future debate concerning uh, uh, addressing uh, a pandemic, next pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Juan Pablo. I would say that um, my, my take is that this only happens and, and takes real form at the country level, in the communities. So we all need to really be supportive of effective and compassionate leadership at the country level. Thank you very much. Jordi. Um, thank you. The current crisis is an opportunity for us to shift the balance of power, to change the alliances, to change the allegiances, the control, who has a say, who gets to make decisions, who gets an invitation to the table. What Michelle said is really very important um, about what the world did and catalyzed around HIV AIDS. And I can't understand why we're not learning those lessons. What I would say is that the global South need to also take responsibility. We, from the global South, we need to stand up and not be waiting for the global North or waiting for somebody else to, to change things, to shift things. So to Michelle's question, I would actually say, let's do it. We're all in this room. We're the global health leaders, you all here, you're all the big ogas at the top, as we say in, in Nigeria, you're the big bosses. You know, we have Tedros, we have you, Jeremy just walked out, we have Victor, we have Ilona. You all are here, let's do it. So let's have this global summit. I put up my hand to help you call the African leaders, call the leaders from around the world. Heck, I'll help you convene it in Abuja, in Nigeria, so that it starts from the global south. Oh, Let's oh convene gosh. this thing. Let's do it. We keep saying it needs to be done. So I would say I'm a Nike girl. Let's just do it. We're all here. Let's do this. Let's get that accountability on the table and let's start it from let the summit come out with that result. We're doing that. Thank you so very much. The challenge is huge, but uh, you know, there's a quote from Angela Merkel, <laughs> we're shuffling us. Okay. And um, I'll let um, my friend, you know, make the conclusion and translate for us what does it mean, we're shuffling us. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. Um, as the host, I have the pleasure, uh, or representing the host, I'm not the host myself, but uh, representing the host, I have the pleasure and honor to um, trying to sum up and to provide, uh, well, more or less the reading to Bia Schaffender's uh, setting that in practice, um, well, in global health. So first of all, I'd like to thank all panelists, all participants for this, uh, well, fantastic, impressive, uh, and breathtaking um, session. I think it was eye-opening. I think um, everybody of us will leave this room um, thoughtful, reflecting on, um, on the interventions. I think this is um, of utmost policy relevance. This is exactly what we wanted to create, uh, passionate debates, um, a frank uh, picture of reality. I'm trying to sum up, it will not take long. Um, so I think what the GPMB um, presentation and report is providing us is a reality check of the status quo of today's um, state in global health preparedness. Uh, we see a world that is, you said, fragmented, um, lack of coordination, resources, if they are there, they are poorly aligned. There's a, um, well, tragedy of inequity, um, a lack of trust, a divided world, um, and uh, even the word a broken world um, is has been seen. So um, is that, um, well, should we leave this room with full of pessimism? And at least my individual answer would be no. I would be completely on the side with uh, um, Jeremy, who just left. Uh, no optimism must prevail. Um, there are great opportunities to change this, uh, the status quo, which I think is, and I think that's more or less the notion in the room, unacceptable to all of us. It's not sufficient to only listen to the outcome of the GPMB. It's not sufficient to only have the political will to change. But what we need is action. So as uh, Asi was mentioning, from words um, to action, we need collective leadership, we need collective force for change, and we need to focus on collective responsibility. However, uh, I would say collective responsibility is not sufficient because I see member states in the setting that I know quite well in the WHO sphere, and it's easy to hide behind collect behind the word collective responsibility. We need to hold member states individually to account in the end. Uh, we all need to move uh, beyond our comfort level to really make a major jump and um, overcome the status quo. Um, with that being said, it's been a, a real honor um, to have you all with us. I think it's there are great opportunities um, to use this um, GPMB report and the outcome. And I will uh, name three um, processes why this is um, uh, obviously why this is so timely and we need to act now. The first one is the treaty, as Barbara Stocking was just mentioning. The treaty um, negotiations are ongoing and it remains to be seen whether the assembly end of November will set the green light to a um, treaty negotiation process. And it's 50-50, I would say, a treaty that could encompass um, equity, uh, which could encompass uh, benefits and data sharing, um, making the IHR um, stronger with a compliance mechanism. That all remains to be seen. The second uh, process is ongoing, and that is, well, enabling WHO with uh, needed resources that, and I think also the GPMB was referring to that, that the WHO currently doesn't have. The working group will, um, the working group that is in charge of sustainable financing will write its final report, and we will see whether we will create a political momentum and consensus uh, to really enable that. And the final one is the G20 with the fifth, um, this financial um, new um, entity, are ongoing. So there's um, lots of opportunity to use the report and not only to listen to it, but really to enable it. So thanks a lot to all of you. And uh, um, it was a really impressive session. Thanks. Thank you very much.